So I have banished the podium, or actually the left turn, if you're a word person, you know, those are two different things. Um, because why have anything come between the love, right? The love for everybody's happening today. And I'm especially really pleased with that video because it just set up a lot of things I'm going to talk about, which is kind of different from how you spent your morning. So I want to just full disclosure on that. Uh, you know, Richard Saul Orman is like the patron saint of inner product beauty. And I really respect his perspective that we go beyond just the look of something into much more how it functions. And I really do believe that that is part and parcel of information architecture. So, we're going to be talking today about information architecture. <laughs> and as a part of a, a bigger practice, broader practice in the U.S. So, hello. I am Kate. Uh, I'm principal of Mitchelletto.com, which is a fancy way of saying I had to work for myself. It's my little corner of the internet. It's not a big company. I don't go in and have colleagues or workers. Um, I work about me and I kind of work and say yes to projects that are interesting and I'm curious about, and no to projects that I think um, aren't going to make the world a better place. So I have a lot of let up latitude with that. But I haven't always had that. I've kind of started a few other places. And I really have been working in the web since, you know, 94, so not as early as 93 when Jose first came out. But uh, pretty close after that. And so I've seen a whole long arc about how our technologies and our practices have evolved. But it really, the learning went into high gear when I joined a firm called Adaptive Path. And they're pretty young. Uh, has anyone heard of the company called Adaptive Path? Or the excellent, or all of the whole community. And I spent seven years there, which is longer than I've ever worked anywhere in my life. I really got to experience the emergence of this field and kind of the way it's become what it is today. After that, I slept shift. I was a co-founder for a startup called Luxor, really involved with the lean user experience and the lean uh, startup movement. So much more about entrepreneurship, much more about how you build, measure, and learn. You start something small and see it kind of emerge and develop into it just something much more um, big, but always, always centered in the human use and the benefit of the provider audience. And then after that, sometimes startups have to run out of money before they run into market. So that will close. Uh, and I went to a company called Tradecraft. Again, very early stage. It's a learning environment, similar to General Assembly. Uh, really focused on having people learn the skills to become UX practitioners, growth practitioners, and sales practitioners in this startup kind of emerging new economy. Uh, so that's where I spent some time. I was one of the, um, the, the pioneers of that UX trap there. Uh, and then I went back on my own. And that's why I met in Aletto. I also, however, at Tradecraft met a woman named Laura Klein, who, uh, you know, is my best friend ever. And because we were both working, kind of educating in this environment at Tradecraft, uh, we kind of fell in love with people fighting with each other, frankly. And so now we host this Not Safe for Work podcast called What is Wrong with UX. And I'm just curious that I know when talking to you, has anyone listened to any of these episodes? Wow, well, thank you. Thank you, because you will also know that sometimes my language is a very ladylike, and I'm just going to embrace that. I know we're live streaming, so mom, I'm sorry in advance, but, uh, you know, too high, I think I already broke the CLD F bomb, so I think we're all friends here. So that's a little bit about me. Uh, these are some of the companies I've worked with. I can guarantee many of them you will have never heard of. You might never hear of them in the future. Some of the ones are startup environments like incubators or accelerators. Uh, some of them are big companies or tech giants, you know. And so I've had some exposure to a bunch of different environments through my UX, UX career. But most of the work that I do tends to look like this. I'm often in big groups working with large teams, sometimes in open workshops on learning practical skills to get our, our work done. Uh, I also work with individual smaller companies, very kind of not right now a lot, because I think sometimes something when it becomes part of the screen, it kind of locks it up in a different way. So I like collaborative work to be face to face in a collaborative space. And then lastly, I also work in some education and on helping people learn the skills and mentor some folks on joining our ever evolving and learning practice. So that is what I do. Things I love talking and listening to people, special user research, really understanding the messy, weird, interesting parts of human behavior and how we can make people's lives easier, make them more heroic. Uh, I love working with other people, teams, and big collaborative whiteboards, in groups, etc., kind of working as, as Alan might say, kind of towards that shared goal. Um, it's not easy work, but it's magical and fun. Uh, I love thinking about policy 
possibilities in the future of things. So I especially love the Blipper talk and some of the work that uh, I think Karina was talking about, about where we're we going, and I'll touch on that in my talk as well. Uh, and then I especially love being able to make pictures and create maps or pictures or images of the world that help people really have a shared picture together. And as our customers are becoming more involved with how we make design decisions, I think this kind of communication is even more crucial. Uh, and just as a side, I love crafting. <laughs> so that says some things about me, but even though we spent half the day together, I really have some questions about you. And what we're going to do is I'm going to go through a series of questions. I'm going to ask you if you want to say yes to raise your hand. You know, it's not there's sometimes when you can raise it more than once after um, with a specific option. And what this is going to help me do is it's going to help me treat certain parts of the topic maybe with a little more detail or a little less detail kind of depending on where the group is. But what it's going to do for you is we are all part of this community. It's going to help you look around the room and maybe identify some folks that you'll want to talk to as well. And I, I struggle with this continuum of a bunch of eyes facing one way and one set of eyes that's terrified <laughs> facing back. So I always try to break up the room and see if we can kind of come together in a different way. All right, so rapid questions. I can keep it fast, so you got to listen. All right. Who has the phrase information architecture in their job title name if they pulled out a business card? I can see it. Woo! Yay! That's <laughs> on. Awesome. So we have one official information architect amongst us. Kudos to you, sir. <laughs> I will also say that increasingly information architect is not a job title. It is a practice, it is a method, it's a mindset, it's a way of working. So it's becoming less rare, which makes you a special snowflake amongst us. <laughs> Multiple choice. All right. Who is a UX generalist? Like you do a bunch of stuff. I make this part though. Good. Awesome. Pretty good memory. What about um? And this is who does what? Not what you're called. Uh, who does information architecture? Right? Kind of classic terms as far as structure and categorization. Good. Smaller handful. What about interaction design? Who here does work with interaction design? Yeah. Popular topic. What about user research? Who are user researchers? Oh, God, this it should really be every man who done it, right? But not everything can do all that, but they don't want it. Um, and then what about other specialties? Anybody here who does not raise their hand at all? <laughs> yes, sir, what do you do? Product management. You're product management, so you tell all the other people what to do, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> Got it. So that's pretty good cover. All right, so let's move on. This is going to be the third hand follow up. So, what kind of products do we work on in the room? Who here works on web? Yeah, a lot of good buddies. What about mobile? Also, good, good scenario. Um, what about connected devices? Other things that are neither of the above, but good, good. That looks like this new area. What about multiple? Who works across multiple of these? Ecosystem or infrastructure things? Okay, about the same number as connected devices. All right. Our next one. Great. Are we doing great? I think we're doing great. <laughs> Excellent. So, what kind of companies do you work in? This is going to be startup or small business, say up to 100 people. Basically, my client, guys are getting busy. Like, it's a workout. All right. Sweet. What about medium business? So, say 100 to 1,000 employees. About the same. Okay, let's go for the big ones. Enterprise, 1,000 or more. Or, okay, so I just call that maybe 30%, 30%, 40%. And now what's the nature of your company? So, in-house. Who's working in-house in a product company? Good set, okay. What about um, a consultancy? Also, small but mighty, excellent. Um, what about government or NGO or education? Something with more of a sense. Yes, I love that. They're like, woo! <laughs> 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 Those are right now. So. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you for the enthusiasm for the hand <laughs> And now the um, bazillion dollar question How long have you been in this kind of practice? It's all self reported data. People are not going to say, okay. I want to see folks, zero to five years, so since about 2012. Love that. All right, what about five to 15 years? 
Okay, the other half of the group. Uh, and then what about 10 plus years? Oh, God's love. It's hello, familiar faces, right? We all probably know each other. Um, and has anyone here been pre-1993? Uh, September 1993. Hello. <laughs> so that was the day Mozilla, which was the first graphical browser, was released. So it's kind of definitely a watermark between before and after. Richard Saul Orman has been working in the field since before that. All right, so let's talk about this thing called IA. Um, we are going to really go more deep into this topic and the specific practices and subtleties that it hasn't been in than we have in the morning. I think there's definitely a, an overall embracing of information architecture topics within user experience, but I do want to honor the IA-ness, if you will, of today instead of having it be more of a general. We have a lot of UX and things in our world. We're very rich with that. I really want to kind of get back to the special degree that information architecture topics can promise us. So today I'm going to be talking about a journey from the foundations, um, you know, pulling the brick wall here, the types of elements that have really built this practice into an information rich environment that we've got today, and then some places where we can flourish some things that we don't know about that might reinvigorate our practice in these specific methods in a unique and interesting way. Uh, I am going to show a video, and if, if nothing else, at the end of this talk, you will be able to fake being an information architect, because <laughs> you'll be able to say all the words. And so there's going to be some tropes here that you should just know about. Many of them old, many of them will be, you know, like, watching the classics for you. Uh, but let's start with this. So when we talk about what is IA, and defining the damn thing, which is kind of a thing, because we're semantically driven in this practice, uh, I want to show you uh, our heavy explainer video that Nate Bolt from Bolt Peters made about, gosh, it was it eight ten, about seven years ago? It's not new. Raise your hand if you have already seen this. Oh, sweet, it's like a new show, right? Everything old is new again. Excellent. So let's watch Nate Bolt. Um, in an award-winning entry, by the way, for explaining IA, describe to us what, what this practice is. Find something, accomplish a task, be entertained, connect with others. 
you probably make as many lists on this as you want, but I found these four to be pretty, have pretty good utility. It also helps me answer these questions. Um, where am I? And uh, am I in the right place? Uh, what is here? And what can I do here? Do they have what I want? And then what else is here? Do they have something I didn't come for, but I also might want to as well? Uh, and in our wheelhouse, in order to make these questions answerable and to deliver these types of experiences, we have a whole bunch of methods and tools, many with very specialized fancy names, right? So navigation, wayfinding, we've got search, we have organizational classification, and structures, and content classification. And our tools, you know, always growing and varying are things like uh, metadata and labeling. It controls vocabularies. Like, I get so excited. You know, we just talked about this yet. Uh, taxonomies, ontologies, and other super awesome concepts. So we're not talking about interaction. We're not talking about VR. We're not talking about all of this world of ideas. We're talking about how concepts go from loose data into structured data and what that enables people to do to get their system. There should be that. So the bulk of the talk is going to be on these three topics. First is a super neat idea that I think just shapes how we can think about our practice. The second is some stories from the field that have recently reinvigorated my connection and my enthusiasm for information architecture basics and foundations, and then some opportunities for us to flourish. So let's get started with a super neat idea. Has, a, has anyone read this book? If you have read this book, Everything is Miscellaneous by David Weinberg, raise your hand. So we've got two people. Oh my God, it's your lucky day. Because this book is going to rock your world. It rocked mine because basically it is a huge fuck you to our field, right? It's like, oh, all that organizing you're doing, all those hard work lists and cognitive mapping, yeah, screw it. Everybody does just use Google, right? And so, but along the way, David Weinberg goes, really interesting observation about how we used to organize things in the physical world and why that doesn't work in the digital world. So he has this concept of three orders of stuff. Okay? And those three orders of stuff is you have a physical thing. I can use washi crafting tape. Washi crafting tape, by the way, awesome, right? One of the most beautiful transformative things you can do is stick some tape on it. Uh, so you've got the order of the thing is the actual thing. Now, the irony of this, of course, is this is a picture of the thing, but you know what I mean, like I don't have a thing. But it's a thing. The second order of the thing is a thing, also physical, that describes the thing, right? So this is a little tag, it's a price tag, a um, label for a retail store, that describes that washi tape. Now, both of these have something in common, which is they are made out of atoms, they exist in the physical world. But there's this third order of stuff, which is just information about the thing. And this is crazy because this shit breaks the laws of physics, right? You can have information that lives in two places at the same time. It's all about links and it's all about duplication. It's all about references. Every piece of metadata in this piece is its own metadata. It's like metadata of metadata, which is mind-blowing, right? So the way that we have third order things just does not behave in the same way at first and second. But we've always been using the same kind of mindset for first and second to go to the third. And that's really changed with the practice of information architecture. So that's a super neat idea. Again, like, mind blown, or is you like, get on with it. <laughs> and look at this is my only chance for feedback, people. Help me out. Yes, man, he's been talking about all day. Yes. I am Could you clarify with an example? Yes, I can. Good example. We'll get into another example, but I'll, I'll precursor this out. You have a book. Let's say we have this book, Everything is Miscellaneous, right? It's a physical thing. It's filled with information, but it is a physical object. So I can have this book, but if someone else is a world IAD in Singapore, they can't have this exact book. They can't copy this book, but it's its own instantiation, if you will. But somewhere there's going to be a card cap book. And it's going to have a, a, information about this book. But there's going to be multiple versions of that card catalog. There's going to be one in the subject, one under W for blind worker, for the author. There's going to be another one maybe on publication date. So you have this piece of information that's a carrier of metadata that is smaller and easier to manage than the physical book. That's the key thing about the second order. Easier to manage, usually smaller. And then you have the third order, which is the ebook version of this, which is in Singapore, and it is here. And every word in this can be, you know, gone through with an indexer and get a word count. You can do a whole bunch of metadata type things with the third object of this book. But 
You don't have to ship the book anywhere. It can be delivered immediately of the information because there's no physical incarnation for it. That's why it's super neat, right? So like, I get it? No way I do. No I don't. So yeah, don't do that. That's why it's a fucking hard deal, right? Let us not you. Alright, so let's go into something else. So um, I'm gonna put some stories from the field. And I have to tell you, so I did something a little weird. Even for me, and as I get older, I get curious or curious or, um, but and this is coming back to what Alan had to say about like, you never know what looks really close. Like most innovation looks stupid, right? Well, it turns out personal growth can look stupid too. Um, but I have to be a little weird. I've been working on my book and it was kind of at home and I was kind of going feral in my own mind. I thought, I gotta, I gotta do something different. I just have to get out of this design, entrepreneurship, product, world thing. I need a release. So I need to go do something else. And so some people travel, they climb mountains, and other people go to a Zen retreat, and other people work out. None of those are going to work for me. Um, but I love crafts. So I worked at Michael's for the holiday season. Yes, I know, right? So that is an odd thing. I get it. You know, photos are going to happen. So this is my last. And this is my name tag. You can see a little bit of my little headset right here. Like, yeah, I walked the floor. I walked the floor. And you know, I learned something from that experience. Uh, I, first of all, I learned that service jobs don't pay shit. It was actually more like volunteering. When people are like, you know, and I'm like, I'm volunteering? I was <laughs> um, Which is a serious issue, and we can talk about the social justice certifications later on over here. But, um, but you know, uh, the second thing is if you decide to do something out of the norm, like, I've been in the US for like 20 years, and yet there's a certain level of kind of expectation socially, and with prestige comes back. You do something else that's totally uncomfortable. You're like, I don't know what box to put you in. I'm like, right, I know. Good. The third thing is, it's amazing what you can learn when you get out of the comfort zone. It just is. And what I learned from this is I was able to follow up with information and architecture all over again. I kind of thought I was done. I thought I jumped the shark, right? But I fell in love because I got to spend every single day being the Michaels you are. I got to spend every day with the people, with the problems. I couldn't run away. I couldn't shut down the browser. I was there. And that changed everything. So it became my love for a lot of foundational work. But I thought maybe it wasn't necessary anymore. And it really helped me get an understanding of where we can flourish. So I now consider myself a boarding in Miami. <laughs> and I'm proud of that. Maybe I'm going to put on a business card, right? <laughs> so let's talk about the stories. There are four of them, and I'm going to start to go pretty quickly. Some of this will introduce concepts that I know are unfamiliar for you. And that's great. You know, I can down Google it, because there's a lot out there. I'm going to talk about four major foundational practices. Search, metadata, navigation, and use. So let's go to search, or in other words, oh my god, I can't find anything. Especially Michael's. Michael's has 40,000 SKUs in a store. That is not individual objects. That is types of objects. 40,000. Anybody else, I mean, other than Salesforce, have a content store like that of different objects? Imagine the metadata. Less, right? So, okay, who here has SERP in your product set? Like it's something that you manage and you deal with. Okay, you might have. Yeah. Estimate. Uh, so here's something. When I was walking around like doing my, my stuff, I started noticing that like letters are a crafting thing. There's all kinds of products you can buy that are letters. You can buy them in beads, you can buy them in letter alphabets in the cake decorating section. And I felt like it tickled me. I was like, another alphabet? Who knew? And you over here in wood. So I started making a list, because that's what people do, of like all the places I found alphabets, right? And letters in my list. Little did I know I was indexing, right? I'm a human search engine, I'm indexing, indexing, building that corpus of data, which became really handy when I was in sketchbooking one day, and one comes over and she's like, hey, I need some help. I'm here for you. And she says, it is Wanda's 60th birthday, and I need some letters. I'm not shitting you, that is exactly what she said. I'm like, I am a search engine that can find you those letters. So, like any good search engine, you know, I started asking questions. Like, what do you think Wanda would like? Like, is it where do you want a lot of cake? Do you want to do it, you know, and into something else? And we started to take our tour, me querying, and she filtering. And, uh, and we walked into the store, and we saw quite a few different letters, and she finally did come with, you know, we narrowed it down, <laughs> stickers, to uh, 
in this selection, there's about three and a half glitter stickers by Lombo, which is a great brand, very sticky. And at the end of this, it was hilarious. This is like, what do you think Wanda would like? And she's like, I'm Wanda. Human story about fear and trepidation. 
you think that this only happens in the first, third, in the first order or third order of problems, let me assure you it does not. Because in my time at Michael's, I came across a lot of stories like this. We are in the scrapbooking section, where very gently piled is a set of letters, maybe it was one, I don't know, but a set of letters and some paint and a little paint thing in the file with the painted letters. You can just see some like, oh, I want some letters, these will work, but I don't want them that color, so I'm going to go paint them, so I'll go get paint, I'll go over here and get the little daughter thing, and then you walk in by, you happen to see the thing you really want, and you're just going to throw that shit down and just pick the other thing, right? And you think shopping cart abandoned, but it's expensive for digital products? Holy crap, I can put all that stuff back. <laughs> so, it's a thing. And what keeps that thing from getting painful? Metadata. Oh my god, metadata. Also called describe it to me. I kind of wanted to call this, tell me what you're wearing, but my husband's like, no, don't say that, that's just awkward. So, um, this guy's to me. So I'm curious who in the room would consider themselves a dedicated indexer taxonomist from catalogger. Oh, okay. So it's like raising your hand, yeah, I do that, kind of. So these are terms, these are things that people do. Um, and go ahead and raise your hand if you've created or revised a metadata schema within the past 30 days. Couple more. Okay. Control vocabulary, synonym rating, the star right? Anyone? Um, like, yeah, kind of there. Well, let me introduce you to Sticker Geddon. Sticker Geddon is your sticker aisle, and this is like metadata on crack, right? <laughs> the only thing that survives putting stickers away at Michael's is your handy beauty scanner gun and a barcode on those, on those signs. It is your only chance. The only way this system can come together is because human beings like us that do things like this and make metadata, right? So that should clear it up. The metadata is the creative material that really stitches together all of the things. And I think it was Karina referred to it, she's talking about AR and NVR and all of these things. It's the metadata that actually enables those overlays to happen and to happen well. And it's really hard. So metadata, this will go into your question a little bit from early, but those third order, first and third, second order objects of life. So metadata looks like this. You've got a bug, your board belt, ambient findability, good read. Uh, and then you have this ancient card catalog, which we don't use anymore, but bear with me. Um, and for each element describing this object, there is a piece of data, right? So this is kind of old school, which is where a lot of information architecture came from, library science. And then we have things that are not information objects, they are at a project, and if you're in Berkeley Bowl, which is very, very particular about its produce, um, you'll get a handwritten side that again is also filled with metadata. So metadata defined as data about data. That's probably something that we're all familiar with. So and metadata has two things, it has names um, and type and then a value with it. So if you're looking at an interface, like the sticker interface on a search engine, uh, it'll say like under price, there are certain things categorize that. It starts to expose information in different ways, make it more accessible, make it more findable. Right? But once you have that metadata, you can use it for all kinds of things. It brings the content set alive. You can use it for personalization, for browsing, for syndication, for auto-generation, especially with the dynamic platforms and CMSs we have now, with how it comes together. But there are caveats. So this is the set of values in the side attribute for us to, for, um, I think it was a paper goods search for Michael's. And you can see that data normalization now is exposed for everybody to see, right? What's the difference between jumbo and large? Don't know. Is it bigger than 12 by 12? Don't know. So with great responsibility, with great power comes great responsibility. All right, getting into our third story. Navigation, we're lovingly called, where the hell am I? <laughs> Uh, when I first started at Michael's, I was like the dumbest piece of technology they ever invested in, right? Because I walked into a store like this and recognized that because they're a high pass, a big box retailer, big box kind of the specialty, they reframe the middle of the guts of the store pretty much every day. So every time I walked in, the entire middle of the store was usually different. Stuff moved around, I couldn't really find it. And so I finally was frustrated because I couldn't even learn where the stable parts were. So I was yanked, I was curious about it with a, a co-worker named Sarah, just like, hell, I'll just draw you a map. I'm like, a map, of course. So she, from her memory, she worked about a year, um, drew me the item numbers and the maps of what's where. Uh, and from that, I made my own map, which was a little bit more detailed, a little bit more fidelity, because I'm like, do a good job, right? It was fascinating working there. 
And, uh, and then from that, I may get another map with more specialty map. So this is a pro tip. If you ever, does anyone shop Michaels? Anyone ever set foot in the Michaels? Awesome. Go there. So here's something to know about Michaels. They have all these house brands, but they're different. So you get the same object that's kind of branded for a different thing. It's their way of trying to make a, a first order object into a third order object, really. So if you want alphabet beads like for a French replacement, if it says bead landing, it's going to be in the bead section. If it says creatology, it's going to be in the kids section. Same product, different packaging. Trying to crack, crack that, that first world, first order problem. Mm -hmm. Yes? Isn't that duplicating It's not duplicating because it's a separate, slightly like there's one attribute on that metadata that's changed, which is the brand. And possibly the price point. Always starting kids. That's my one secret thing. Always look for what you want kids before you go anywhere else in a specialty store. Save yourself some money. So for example, the price point. It's kind of like, you know, you take a corn chip and you make it a circle and then you charge more for it. Right? People have been doing this when you tell them. <laughs> so, uh, so make maps. And this is something all of us can do. You can make them really low fidelity. Make them together with other people. You can make concept maps that don't have any implication for physical space or even navigation layout space. Uh, this is a conceptual map that's basically word pairs, so noun, verb, and object. Um, and it created an entire interaction model for a, for a product I worked on when I was at uh, when I was in Jack and Pat. They can get, you know, fairly, this by the way, if you want this, it's publicly available. It's um, smart at them. And you can look that up. Alexa Enderjeski was the project manager on this one for product B. And so they also can have a little bit more structure, or they can be relationships about more organizations related to each other, things that aren't as observable in the real world. They can start out as one phase, and then they can stretch like this one with Rail Europe, which is a client I work with, um, and then adapt to that on the service design and the service journey mapping. So you can take all kinds of things. But I'm curious, who here has made an app of anything within their product within the last 30 days? Sweet. Those, that's a good thing, right? Was it helpful? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good for maps. And as our spaces become less physical, those maps become more important because we can't all um, we can't all observe the same concrete things. You want to buy into an idea of something. So keep making those maps, make them together, make them low fidelity, and then revise them. Those maps also become incredibly helpful when we talk about navigation. Uh, navigation is a known thing. It's kind of a shared space between interaction design and information architecture. So I know we need to go through like one little sliver of it. Uh, but navigation in a physical store is often similar. You got global. There's like these like 20 by 5 by 10 foot signs up around the perimeter of the building. They're very basic. Good luck using those. Uh, and then you can have more local navigation at the end of each aisle. So it's basically aisle 99, and then you have even more, kind of, say, categorization or, or smaller navigation. This is, again, it's a different aisle. Occupations and hobbies and animals, ironically, not really in the same place, but still, for the point of argument, um, still a good navigation type. And then you have that detail, you have that game tag, which tells you what the price is. So what's funny is when the first world started out with the web, like we thought this was a pretty good model, so we just replicated that shit, right? Skeuomorphism. So this is actually the Southwest Airlines interface and in UI in 1996. I am not kidding you. This UI is older than like, some of you in the room. That's fine. Um, it turns out they were not alone, right? New York Times still did that. Although it looks like they're kind of their thing, they actually still kind of look like that. They had a huge ad trying to, you know, maintain their their business model in any way they can um, that takes over most of the content place. And then you get things like this precious one, the Bitmap Living Room, um, for the Internet Public Library, which is sadly no longer with us. So, um, but awkward. And now all of our interfaces, like they don't look like the real world, they do carry this kind of navigational hierarchy with them. And so this is the how we should think Michael's website. Uh, and it has a series of really terrific things going on. It's got a very detailed taxonomy. Uh, it has rich metadata and facets that you can search on. It's got really robust search and really context-appropriate placement authorings as well. So you can see now they're merchandising the navigation itself, which is something that the core principles of the store design, too. So what can we do about this? Well, we can look to our taxonomies. We can intentionally design them, and we can look at how that can activate 
new ways of moving through our worlds and materials. Or, you know, um, a fanboy from uh, David Weinberger uh, made this lovely worry in your taxonomic trees having your leaves. So let's talk about use, this last one, which is basically people just like their shit ton. Right, and I thought it was interesting talking about um, you know, this flipper about like there's names and all these wonderful things, but once the novelty wears off, like where do you think? Right? Ultimately, and do not quote me, but ultimately Michaels is just a barrier between a person having a creative experience and the shit they need to do it with. Like that is a transaction business. And they're working very hard not to be a transaction business. Um, but it's kind of where they're at. The thing is you can never predict what someone will buy and what they will do with it. So it's January, and it's past December, and most of the crowds have gone. And I notice patterns, I'm working the register, right? And uh, one of the patterns I see is lots of gift cards, lots of returns. Pretty predictable. And then this guy comes in. The pattern I didn't expect to see is he sold like 12 certificate of insurance frames like in one day. Like I wrote them up, so who knows how many other things were rung up by others. Um, but this guy comes to my register, and he's got six of these, and I'm like, I can't stand it. Like, why would people buy? Is it just time to feel achievement? Are they like <laughs> planning ahead for their new relationship? What's going on? So I talked to my young fellow, Alan, because I need a name. I didn't get a name with my only office of privacy laws, but I did. But, so yeah, so he's checking out, and I'm like, hey, these. He goes, so I work alone, and I work in a big studio, and they're coding my computer all day, and I live in kind of read there. So I got this big wall. And what I do is I print out eight and a half by 11 pictures of my friends. And I put them up on the wall, and then I'm surrounded by my friends, but I work all this. I'm like, wow, that is fabulous. I could not have predicted that a certificate of achievement would do that. But <laughs> that is because I was just looking at the positioning of it. What he was saying is that for cheap, you could get a package of three of these 8.5 by 11 things, which would fit to standard, which would fit a standard printout, right? And then he says, yeah, and he would start to be an asshole, I just take the photo now. <laughs> <laughs> Order of business, right? So what are people doing with our stuff? And on this, it's really amazing because we have a lot of practices for this. We've got design research, we've got um, validation testing, all kinds of things. And Michael's is doing something interesting on this too, which I hadn't really thought out and realized, which is really more, you can now watch what people are doing with your stuff. You can watch them through social media. And in the crafting world, that happens within the context actual domain of what Michael's hosts, right? So they've hooked into hashtags, they've hooked into the, uh, into the YouTube channel, they've hooked into their Instagram feed. They're really trying to create an environment of crafting because although they may go from the business of selling craft products, they're in the market of making people more creative. And so that is a pretty sophisticated thing. I especially love the fact that you can index, they index their own sponsored hashtags as well. A different form of metadata that's kind of self-emergent from the community. So how do we get all of our hands around this stuff? Well, I'm going to suggest that you do a content analysis. I know this will not be popular. And I know it's not popular because ages ago when one of the seminal articles about this came out, uh, it was called a mind numbingly detailed odyssey through your website. But this also goes for mobile. It goes through interaction patterns elsewhere. It's not just limited to a website. Uh, so this is, you know, 12 years old. Is this still valid? Oh, yeah. It was valid a few years ago. Christina Halverson, um, really pioneering content strategy as a practice within our WQX. Um, also reinforced that that Excel is your friend. You really got to know, and you need to know the depth of your content. And now we have books that teach you how to do it. Uh, but what I think is interesting is you can do that not just with your own content, but outside. Because social media allows you to see what other people are doing on behalf of your company, outside your own domain. So go ahead and raise your hand if you've done any content analysis within the last 30 days. A couple people. How was that for you, Jamie? It was, it was actually really good. <laughs> this is awesome. Afterwards, you can come closer to the five minute science. I don't think I can speed it up anymore, but I will keep going. Good news is there's three approaches. You can do a full inventory, which is very, very rigorous. You can do a partial inventory, sampling down into kind of major sections or corpuses of your information, or you can do a rolling inventory. 
where you make it just part of your practice. Like looking at those search logs you do a couple times a month, ongoing, you'll develop that expertise. Because you only know, you need to know what you have in order to organize it in effective ways. The reason we're looking at felt here is because doing a content inventory is like being a felt whisperer. You cannot just stuff a new piece of felt into a felt display uh, because it's super sticky. You have to take the entire stack of felt out. You don't know this entire stack of felt out, rearrange it, and put it all back in. And that kind of reminded me of doing a content analysis. I was able um, to stay one day and clean up the felt from an organization perspective that just made me super happy. So what's next for me? Well, I've got a project, and uh, based on this rekindled love of the basics, I'm going to do some things on that project. I'm going to confirm that we have shared goals, like, uh, like table stakes. I'm going to talk to people, listen to them, make sure they really understand their needs, also table stakes. But I think I'm going to go a little bit deeper into information architecture basics, right? And make maps, I'm going to take a look at some content analysis, both inside and outside that domain, to be designed for a fairly significant digital product. Uh, I'm going to have to inspect the metadata, uh, consider what taxonomies, the summary and control vocabularies might benefit the business and the users, and then also take a look at that, those search elements. So to wrap up, I'm going to talk about a couple opportunities to flourish. Um, three, and I'm going to go through again this pretty quickly. Um, the, the physical and digital smear is real. Right? So this is for people coming in with a physical object, they're going into a physical space, but they're doing a digital thing in it. And it's going to get messy, we don't really understand it. I think the Blipper presentation did a really nice job of setting up the utility of things that are doing like this, look like this, which is physical interactions with pure third order objects. Right? This is the Tesco stores in Korea. All of this is digital. Those are pictures of things, they're just incarnations of things. That's going to create new sets of metadata for us. That's going to create new work that we need to do. And there's also Alibaba, as late as this holiday season, was looking at virtual reality and augmented shopping experiences. And I think about Wanda being able to walk through, grab a set of goggles, and look around and see all the letters she wanted to do. And what would that do with her? Put those two environments here. We also have this concept of splitting and clumping, which I love because it's the most felt it so beautiful, so beautifully. Uh, this is about making bigger things smaller and smaller things bigger, right? So one clumping and splitting is a way of transforming your product to stuff you already have. It's not maybe out of the box invention, but it's hugely innovative when you can add an attribute and then you capitalize, uh, capitalize on new use. So the textbook story on this is like, I love this album. I know you can judge me later, right? My goals are now ABBA. Not friends. Uh, and I also love this, which is what I used to play set, set album. And if I had a really, really beloved person, I would make a mixed team, which is pretty much in the 70s and 80s the best way you could express your love, right? Because it's so much effort. And then, obligatory um, Apple slide here. What comes along? Well, the ability to carry all of those tracks in your pocket with the device, the ability to search and find them in a new way in this third order element. And then the ability to buy it by track instead of album because the production costs were so much different. So the math just worked really differently. I also do love the dancing food is so popular because that's my favorite song. So that really transformed it. And it was about splitting an album up and then being able to refactor that and repurpose it. Now, just because it's simple, and hindsight doesn't, of course, mean that it was simple in practice, but these are new possibilities information architects can bring to the table when we start talking about um, innovation. And lastly, let's go to the other way. Let's talk about clumping. And for this, I'm going to talk about just a, a, a more efficient interaction. So we've got this whole craft thing. We've got projects, which again, part of making Michael similar stuff is invigorating people to do things. And for each of their project pages, they've got a lot of information. They've got a step-by-step, -step, a how-to video, a set of materials, etc. But then down here, they've got this interesting interaction, which is basically like, buy the whole thing, like just one clip. And this is an example of clumping, right? Now, if you want to buy the whole thing, you need to be out there and $158.58. not sure if the Chevron painting is worth that for you, but um, it's interesting because it really just removed a whole bunch of search friction right there. Because in this case scenario, people don't want to buy the shit. They just want that result. So then made it clumping gives us new uses and more efficient uses so that people can do things faster. 
And then lastly, like keeping our eye on the prize. I tell you, nothing forces self-reflection more than walking down the kids' aisle and having a broken, bad, wiggle eye staring up at you deeply <laughs> from the floor. Right? But in a way, that's kind of what we do, right? We as a craft, as a practice, we observe people. We talk to them, we listen to them. And then we learn, we rinse, and we repeat it. And we do it over and over. That is the nature of what we do. That's really the purpose of our work. I want to close it with uh, a recognition that, yes, we work in technology. But technology and the work we do is also a craft. And if you look back at the origins, that makes perfect sense. Because the origin of technos, as a word in Greek, is the same as craft. And it's our job, with these practices, and with other allied US-based practices, and with other colleagues and team members, to be that magic glue. And to pull it together, and to aggregate this, tech, this crazy third order bunch of stuff into things that people can understand, use, and flourish with. So with that, I thank you on my unicorns, especially our Croatian architecture unicorn. And I say, uh, thank you so much. I don't know if you have any time for questions, but if so, I'm here all day. Mm-hmm. <laughs>